Oh, thanks Ooh. for that. Okay. And they said, um, <laughs> careful they said, what you say. Yeah. This is a new feature that. That was a new one, yeah. And um, I said to them, I was like, um, I'll cycle it back. And it's literally a mile. It's a mile on a bike. I come back in and my wife said, You're right. I said, Whoever said you don't forget how to ride a bike is bullshit. I was like, it absolutely, I couldn't even like move my legs. Everything was burning. I was like, oh God. It was all downhill as well. <laughs> it, was, it was uphill. It was uphill. Yeah. But even that, and then I was like, I'm going to do a bike ride. And then the week, a couple of days later, I was like, I'm going to do a bike ride in our village. I couldn't even get around the village. Like, I literally couldn't. Be five and a half minutes, I think the bike ride was, before my legs started to give out. I was like, God, they're burning up. Like, it's so sore. So we'll see. It's like anything, though, isn't it? If you train for it, like you can be really fit in one aspect. Like you could be a really good runner, but you get on a bike, you're like, oh. absolutely. It's, it's very kind of whatever you train for is what you're good at. Uh, yeah, I think it'll be it'll be um, it'll be good fun to get back into it. That's for sure. Yeah, I need to. <laughs> it's very true, Dan. I remember I, I was at my fittest. I was like down to like eight percent body fat. I was super hench. I was really happy. And I remember going out to Spain and, and meeting a friend of mine. And he was about 18 stone, massively overweight. He said, should we go for a run? I was like, yeah, Sanya. Honestly, he ran rings around me. Mm. Absolute rings around me. And I was just like, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And he was mocking me. But then I got him in the gym and we did a bit of a superset. And honestly, he couldn't last about three minutes. It was yeah. all down to conditioning and what the body's used to and what you exactly. need to do, which is why you need to change it up all the time. Yeah. That's, that's what we used to do CrossFit. Like I hate CrossFit. I hate it. And I was a bodybuilder. Like I was, I was a fitness model when I was younger. That's what I did. That was one of my jobs. You can and, tell. Uh, yeah. <laughs> not now. Um, and uh, like, I'm good at lifting heavy weights. Like I can lift heavy weights, but when you put heavy weights in combination with any form of cardio, like, and it all falls apart. And I'd just be that guy in the CrossFit gym when I'd be like, I couldn't do it. So I'd be like, well, come and look at me lift 225 kilos for six reps on a deadlift. Fuck you. <laughs> like, you know, like, or like, or I curl it and I'd be like, my wife would be like, do you think you're clever? Because you just look like a prat. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I feel like a prat. So that's why there go I'm your going joints. In. Well, that's why I'm going in by myself because I'll just know what will happen. I'll get like all like, oh. So I thought I'll go in by myself for like six weeks. You're, in, you're an ego lifter. Is that what it is? I'm a huge <laughs> ego lifter. I'm very aware of that, you know? Like, so I, I can't deal with it. <laughs> It just, and I'll just it, break something. Yeah. It does feel good lifting heavy weights, though, doesn't it? It gives you a nice feeling. After. No, it feels awful, Dan. I don't know what you're that. <laughs> it feels horrendous, mate. It just, well, it's the day after. I, it's like, I just feel like I've worked hard, and it just feels satisfying. That satisfying feeling for me is like, that's why I do it. I don't do it. Do you, like know, do you know what I've done, Dan, recently? Honestly, this will make a difference. And you'll probably agree with this, Ash. I've took the weight right down. It's form and volume so it's time under tension and i'm mm. finding i'll get much better results doing that just take the weight down get it right really isolate the muscle and then just focus on it and get it get it burning that yeah. works much better the only thing i always find as well is like my wife is a um she's an olymp she's an olympic weightlifter that's what she does sure and she's a, yeah and she's a medalist so she was under she won under 25 she's a bronze medalist under 25s and like she's a beast in regards to strength you know so like no matter what i do there is nothing i can do that that like pro rata you know pound for pound is ever gonna compete mm. honestly all my mates there was used to be like well she's, she's like a you know she's a machine she's super strong yeah. also, Sam, i absolutely love your tattoo you i found you on facebook on instagram i think ross tagged you or something your tattoo is amazing thanks it is um a work in progress which has been for about four years um, my tattooist is um well, one, I had babies, as you can hear in the background. And two, they, um, my tattoo is, is stuck in Australia. She's like half from Liverpool, half from Australia. Now they're like locked in for the foreseeable. So, so she's finished it, has she? She's not half done it, has she? <laughs> done it. No, she's got half done. I'm half done. Uh, yeah. It's a full like back piece right down to my thigh. Yeah. Um, and it's, well, the top part, so I can wear like a, like a back. I can have my back out, but if, in a bikini, I don't look too good because it's half done. <laughs> it looks amazing. Oh, it thanks. Looks amazing. Yeah. Like, I love tattoos. So as soon as yeah. I like... Nice bit of artwork. I, like, oh. I like it too. Especially like, I like tattoos that are like, it sounds silly, but like, when they're like body suits, you know, when they border on the line of like, yeah, it's like a, it always it's reminds you of like crocodile done day day. You know, and he goes, <laughs> that's not a knife. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's what it always reminds me. I've always been like, you know, <laughs> when there's not much skin exactly. showing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
50% of the body. All right, okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll crack on. It's, uh, it's 10 past, so I think everyone's in who's going to be in. So uh, today, this is all about protection and business protection. So we've got the man for the job, the, uh, the expert in the field. Uh, so Mr. Chapman's going to uh, going to share some knowledge today on on business protection. I know we did that little uh, that vote thing in the in the groups, and, and that business protection was the one that it came up trump. So uh, so yeah, Matt's uh, Matt's going to share some knowledge on business business protection. So um, yeah, so Matt, uh, do you want me to? Are you doing the slides, mate? Shall I share the screen with you? Or give you uh, how she no, that's fine. It's okay. We, we I, I mean, I've got, I've got stuff I can share if people want it. But I guess what we'll do is it's okay with the guards. We'll just kind of play it by ear based on what they want out of the session. Because I think I could go into huge amounts of detail. I could keep it generic, but it's really down to what what the guards are going to get most value out of. I mean, I think with business protection, is it right in thinking that you guys predominantly you want to learn about business protection because that's more your target market or the kind of sector you want to get into or potentially something that you think is quite lucrative? Well, I can say, yes, it absolutely is. It's really, really good. Business protection can be quite a hard nut to crack because it all depends on how you enter the market and it all depends on who you work with and your target demographic. It's a bit like what the guys are saying when it comes to the work you're doing with the new age advisor stuff. And you've got to be quite specific about who your target market is. And that's quite difficult in the business world because there's like 6 million SMEs across the UK and it's quite hard to go, oh, what, which kind of sector do you want to go into and which type of business to want to operate with so there's some things you can do to just kind of make life easy for you now when it comes to business protection my general thoughts on it are that you ought to think that in in many respects you can split the market into two sectors right so you can say you've got business protection which is proper core business protection key man insurance shareholder protection partner protection uh loan protection for businesses and guarantors and then you've got what i would call the the, the bit that blurs the line it's kind of like soft business protection where it's essentially personal protection putting in expenses. And I think where people go wrong is what they do is they, they kind of don't really do either properly. And what I'd say to you guys is this, it's really simple. This personal one here is really good because it's a great gateway into the business. So if you think about it, most business owners have no idea that they need business protection, that business protection exists or what it is, how it works. And a lot of advisors go wrong because they enter the business by going, oh, I can sort your protection out and you can put it on expenses. Well, I'll tell you now, key man insurance, it's very unlikely you're going to put on expenses because most key man insurance policies are for business owners. And once you go over 5% shareholding, you're not getting relief on the premiums, you get relief on the benefit. So do not sell business protection, core business protection off the back of tax relief or tax efficiency because it won't work. What's, what's key man support. insurance, Matt? Right, key man insurance. Do you want me to go through the different products? Shall I do that? Is that you want to do? So I, just, I'm literally... Um, quite new to business protection. I don't know about anyone else, but, um, so I'm... Should we start with the basics then? <laughs> so I'm the yeah, no, I reckon it's fine. It is, even if people know the basics, it's good to get reminded of them, I yeah. think. So just... Okay, yeah, that's fine. Well, split the products, right? So let's start over here with what I would call personal cover on expenses, right? And this is the, these are the two products that really blur the lines. Now, what's really interesting is, is relevant life is one of them and executive income protection is the other. Now, the beauty is probably, I would say I probably know more than most people about executive income protection, which is really, really good because I can answer any questions you've got about that. Um, so two products that are personal that you can put on expenses are relevant life and executive income protection. So relevant life is essentially private death in service. So if you can imagine it like it's like you get from a group scheme, you know, when you've got business protection, it's a life insurance contract paid for by the business for the benefit of the employee. That's absolutely correct. And in the eyes of the law, where you've got a limited company, that is a standalone entity. And this is where it gets a little bit complex. I know when you deal, if you're dealing with mortgages and someone comes to you and they own their own company, a limited company, they're going to go, yes, I'm self-employed. When it comes to business protection, they're not. They're employed by their own limited company. OK, that's a really important factor. If you don't treat them as an employee, you won't get the product you want. I mean, literally as simple as if you're sourcing on legal in general, if you don't put them as an employee of the business, executive income protection doesn't even come up as an option. Okay, they have to be an employee. Regardless of the fact they might own 100% of the shares in the business, it makes no difference. From an HMRC point of view, you've got the business entity, which pays its own tax, and an individual that draws an income from the business, and they pay income tax and national insurance contributions on those earnings. They're two separate entities and keep them apart. 
So the simple ones are relevant life and executive income protection. Relevant life, like I said, life insurance. It's usually done on income multiples. So if someone pulls out of their 50 grand in terms of income and dividends, you'd normally say, right, well, you can have income multiples and it goes quite, quite a lot, depending on age, 25, sometimes up to 40 times. Um, and it's a great way for someone to put personal life insurance on expenses. You're saying, look, great, tax efficient. You can have it as your own private death in service policy. Get the business to pay the premiums. You can put your life insurance on expenses and be done with it. That's a really good contract. And that's the sort of product you ought to go in with to then start, start to talk about the business protection needs. Because it's very simple, very easy for them to understand. It kind of gets you across the line. It gets you doing that corporate fact find where you're going to identify what other needs the business might have. So that's relevant life. Executive income protection is by far the best business protection contract you can get because it's essentially income protection, but paid for by a company. And it's phenomenal. Self-employed limited company directors or employees of limited companies. Wow, absolutely phenomenal. You're chucking pens at me, Ross. Yeah, sorry, I just, <laughs> I was that blown away. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, generally speaking, this is one of the best contracts and it's widely underutilized, widely underutilized. Um, Legal in general, only last year, would have been November last year, launched their income protection contract, their executive income protection contract. Uh, there's Unum, Canada Life, and I think Aegon is the other one. Depending on which network you are, whether you're DA or whatever, you, you might not have access to all, but Legal in general is one that you can normally get through most agencies. It's really easy to use. Um, if you quote for that one, you'll have to do it directly. There's no portals that allow you to quote, so you have to go directly on OLP Connect and set up an, an application to generate the quotes. And again, like I say, put them down as an employee. The fundamental difference between personal income protection and executive income protection is that with personal protection, you're talking about protecting net income. So you'll say someone earns 40 grand a year gross. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to protect 60 percent of it. So the benefit that they get paid is net. There's no tax on it. They receive the money. They can use it as they want to. It's like they were just still earning from work. And that's why you never see personal income protection products at higher levels because it has to allow for what they would normally pay in tax. So they'd receive the net benefit. And I'm getting a bit complicated. But the executive income protection is different because it pays out 80 percent, up to 80 percent, plus national insurance contributions, plus pension contributions if you want to. So you can essentially insure almost all of someone's income. But what happens is rather than going to the individual, the benefit is paid to the company. So if you can imagine it's like permanent sick pay, right? The company takes out the policy, the company pays the premiums. And then if the person's ill, the company submits a claim on behalf of the employee. And what would happen is the money would be paid from the provider to the company. Once the money's in the company, the company then pays the person as normal, whether it's PAYE, whether it's salary and dividends, whatever they normally do to pay the individual. And you'll hear lots of providers saying it has to be PAYE. That's a load of bollocks. It makes no difference. Once the money hits the company's account, the provider has no control whatsoever on how it's paid to the end user, right? So the actual policyholder themselves, the individual that's assured. So you can actually have it paid into the business. And if it's a director, they can still pay themselves a salary and dividends and still make it tax efficient. So they don't essentially lose out on any, any income. But it's really important when you're quoting, because if you calculate someone needs, say, £2,000 of benefit, when you're doing the cover, you have to gross it up because you have to allow for the fact they're gonna pay tax on the money they pull out the business, okay? So you must gross it up. Don't just do two grand, otherwise what they'll actually net is more like 1,400 quid, 1,200 quid, right? Can I ask, with, the, um, with that policy, yep. where they'll get sort of 80% of the income paid to the business, yep. when the business then pays it to the individual, is there a tax liability there? Yeah, in the same way that they would normally. So if you can imagine, I've got my own limited company. At the minute, I pay a nominal salary of like 12 grand and then I say dividends. Um, the same would apply. So once the money hits the business, if you imagine, you've almost got to separate it. And you think the money goes to the business and the business decides how it's paid. In the eyes of the law, it hits the money as a trading receipt, like invoiced income. So it comes into the business. The business gets the money. It goes, right, how do I want to pay? Now, if it's your own business, like if you're the director, you just go, oh, I'm going to pull out nominal salary and dividends, right? But you'll have to pay tax on the earnings. Because in the eyes so, of the law, that's, that's where you get the tax efficiency, right? So you'd get like sort of 80% of the salary and then minus tax again. So you only really sort of get 
you what sort of 70 percent the same 60 odd percent as you would on a personal one but the difference is it's tax efficient because the business gets to pay the premiums and it is a tax deductible expense it's one of the two contracts that is legitimately a tax deductible expense without question so you could say to someone relevant life and executive income protection you can put them on expenses so you can put your life cover and your income protection on expenses which means the company pays reduce your corporate tax liability it's nice and cheap jobs are good those are the only two i would ever say with any degree of certainty you're going to get tax relief on okay because the others are a bit questionable i'll go to that in a minute those are the two nice simple easy ones but you're absolutely right Liam. money into the business once it's in the business the business pays the individual and the individual would pay normal income tax national insurance p11d whatever it is so what I would say there is that's why you want to add the national insurance contributions on top of the 80 percent. And if you can put a pension allowance on top as well. Money goes into the business. That's really important. When the money goes into the business, the individual has to draw it out. Otherwise, it's treated as profit. Because it's a trading receipt. Right. So the money goes into the business. Unless you draw it out, the business is making more money than it normally does because there's nothing coming out of it. Right. So it's really important they draw the money out as normal. Essentially, what you're doing with these products is saying to people, look, if you need income protection, just put on expenses if you've got your own company. That's how you're doing it. And if you need life cover, put on expenses, get the business to pay. Why not? Right? So there's there's that, literally no benefit to having a, a personal, if you own a business, there's no benefit to not to having a personal one. It's, it, you may as well put it through the business and save 20%. Well, I've, got, I've got mine through the business. Yeah. I've got half a million quid's worth of relevant life cover and I've got an executive IP plan as well through the business. Why not? I mean, the business pays. It comes, it, it's, it's, a, it's a twofold thing because not only do you get tax relief on the premiums, but of course it's therefore reducing your corporate tax liability as well. So you get the full tax relief on the premiums and then of course you're actually reducing the amount of profit the business creates, so you're reducing your corporate tax liability. Yeah. Essentially, the way, to, the way to think about it is if you put life cover, now essentially the price is like for like, right? There is no additional cost. If you price up exec IP, at 80%, proportionally, it's just a 20% uplifting cost. But they're getting 20% more benefit. But the business is paying, so it's like neither here nor there. And with relevant life, the premiums are almost identical to if you did it as a personal policy versus a business one. So essentially, if you think of it this way, if you're not then having to draw money out the business, pay national insurance and income tax, and then pay 12% insurance premium tax to the provider personally, you're, you're basically saving about 50%. So on a normal high rate taxpayer, they're saving 50% by having their policies through the business. So I know I'm getting a bit complex with the numbers, but the way you've got to think of it, if you don't want to keep it really, really simple, exec IP and relevant life are a great way for company owners to put their personal cover on expenses. That's the way to do it. If you're thinking, if you came to me and said, Matt, how about I can take all these personal policies you've got here and make the business pay for them? I'd be like, brilliant, where do I sign? And the other thing about that as well is that business owners, generally speaking, don't think about premiums. Like we're paying about 680 odd quid a month on our protection premiums through the company. I don't even notice it. it just comes out of my gross earnings. I'm like, yeah, whatever, business pays. But if it came out of my pocket, shit, that's a different conversation, right? So it's, it's a very different sort of aspect when you're dealing with company owners. So one way you could do this is as a, as a gateway, as an entry, is think about your clients who you've got as clients. Anyone you've got who's a company owner, a limited company owner, anyone that's a director of a business, they're your perfect target market. You know, if you go on LinkedIn and just search for directors and go, hey, listen, I just I saw that, you know, we're connected. You're a director. I thought it'd be worth giving you a shout because I'm currently working with business owners to try and save them tax on their personal insurance contracts. If you fancy having a chat, I can give you a couple of no obligation quotes. I mean, reach out to them because all you're going to do is get a no or a yes. If you get a yes, you sit down and go, brilliant. To do those two contracts, because the company ultimately takes out the contracts, you're going to need to do a corporate fact find. And when you do a corporate fact find, you're going to identify other key people in the business. How many shareholders are there? Do the business have any loans? Are the directors' loans accounts? Are there any guarantors? And all of a sudden, you're opening up this whole suite of business protection needs and you go, brilliant, there's a grand a month premiums. Seriously, it's that simple. I got someone contact me the other day for key man insurance. So weird. All they've done is they've just secured £2 million worth of investment. And it was a random one that came to the internet. And they've gone, oh, can you look at key man insurance? And we've kind of gone around the houses. It's a 40 grand commission. A 40 grand commission, right, for arranging seven key man insurance contracts. 
just because the, the investors demanded that the company has key man insurance. The opportunity is ridiculous. You've just got to go out there and find it, bang on some doors and go, right, speak to me, talk to me. How can I help? Most business owners, the other thing I was going to say, I'll go into key man in a minute, but when you think about companies tendering for contracts, if you go for construction contracts, public sector contracts, or anything else like that, um, most firms that award the contracts will want to see that the company they're awarding the contract to have key person insurance in place because they need some form of guarantee that the contract's going to be fulfilled. So target firms that specialize in civil engineering contracts and public sector work and dealing construction because they'll all need it and they won't have it. They, they will lie. They literally stand there. I've dealt with a client before who lied to the company who's trying to get the contract from saying, yeah, I've got key man insurance. They're both like, Matt, I need key man insurance. And it's like, it's, this is how the world works. So those are your two simple ones. And what they are essentially are personal protection for the employee and their family. Think of it like family protection, but paid for by the business. The best way to distinguish them is this. Those two are like employee benefits, right? Relevant life, executive IP, they're like permanent sick pay or life cover, death in service for the employee paid for by the business. Totally tax efficient, thumbs up, everyone's happy. There's no issues with that. The accountant will love it. Absolutely love it because it's all tax efficient. The other three are core business protection needs. Whereas those pay out benefit to the employee and their family, these ones pay to the business. The money goes into the business to support the business. So these are business continuity contracts, the way I look at them. They're profit protection. They're there to support the company not the individual, the employees or the directors, the company. Now, by default, it does protect the business owners because they own shares in the business. But there is a distinct separation between the two. Personal, business, employee, company. Separate the two. Key man insurance. Sorry, I've got a dog. Key man insurance is one of the primary ones. It's probably the most difficult one, the most complicated one to do. Because key man insurance is a bit subjective in many respects, because it's there to protect the profits that a key person in the organization generates for the company. So if you can imagine in my business, you might argue it's me, but there actually might be other key people within the business that generate income for the business. And it's not necessarily just me as the business owner. Now, the way this works is it's quite interesting. All you're going to do is effectively do a calculation most owners will know what they want, so you don't need to worry about getting it right. Most owners will know what they want, but it's about calculating. If I lost that individual, how much would it cost me to replace them? How quickly could I recruit them? And what does that look like in terms of loss of profits? There's simple calculators you can use for this. Most providers, AIG, Royal, and they've all got their own calculators. You can use them. But I will say this, and I'll stress this. You're not responsible for calculating that figure. Right? You can provide guidance, but don't ever take responsibility for calculating someone's key man insurance, right? That's the job of the accountant or the business owner. You can give them guidance through a calculator, but you need them to ratify. It's not your job. Not your job at all. We want to be really clear about that one. But what you're essentially going to do is you're going to say, right, if you lose this person, what's it going to cost you? Now, if that individual is a genuine employee, a genuine key person that doesn't own shares in the business, you'll get tax relief on the premiums on that one. But if they own more than 5% of the business, there's no tax relief. They don't get tax relief on the premiums because in the eyes of the law, what you're saying is, well, hold on. If you own shares in the business, you're one and the same thing. So if you insure yourself via the business, why would you get relief? However, I would say 99% of all key man insurance or key person insurances that you do will be for people that own more than 5%, right? It's just the way it is. So when you speak to them, the way to position it is to say, listen, in all honesty, you're not going to get tax relief or it's unlikely you're going to get tax relief on the premiums because you're also a significant shareholder of the business. So you probably won't get tax relief on the, on the premiums. However, there is a good news to this, which is if you need to claim and this half a million quid gets paid to the business, you won't get taxed on that. Okay, because otherwise they could be paying 20 plus percent in corporate tax on that benefit when it hits the business. Whereas if they get they get relief on that as opposed to premiums, it's probably going to end up being a much better deal for them in the long run, assuming they need to claim. Right. So that's how you that's how you sugarcoat that one. But again, I want to be really clear. This is using something called the Anderson principles, by the way, which is a, a legal precedent to do with how that is treated from an HMRC point of view. 
But I'll say this again, it is not your responsibility to determine the tax treatment of those premiums or benefit. And you say, look, it's unlikely or this is likely to happen, but it's the job of the accountant to determine how those premiums and benefits treated. That's their job. That's their specialty. Leave them to it. OK, let them and the business owner decide how it's treated. Your primary function as the advisor is to provide the fiscal benefit they need if something happens to that key person. Not about how it's treated, how it's taxed, how it's insured, whatever. It's not irrelevant, right? Your job is to say, right, if that person dies or gets cancer tomorrow, how much do you need to keep the business going? How does it? How do we replace the profits and keep the business afloat? I'll tell you, half a million quid, brilliant. That's all I need to do. I'm going to arrange the policy. You worry about how it's treated. That's it. Okay. So that's key man insurance. The next one, shareholder protection, slightly more complex in the sense of with shareholder protection, what you've got there is two or more shareholders in a business. Imagine that Ash, Ross, Dan and I owned a business together. That would be an interesting one, wouldn't it? But let's assume we own a business together. Yeah. Each of us have 25% shares in this business and I die tomorrow. Now those guys don't inherit my shares. My wife does. So what they might find is well, on a minute, Joe's got nothing to do with the business. She doesn't really know how we operate. She's got no involvement in it. And she's got this 25% stake. So we need to buy offer. We need to buy that 25% back. And Joe goes, yeah, yeah, my 25%, it's worth half a million pounds. You go, but we're only, we're only turning over 100 grand a year. Now it's worth half a million pounds. And you end up with this horrible situation where the shares were inherited by someone who has little or no interest in the business might choose to sell those shares to a competitor, isn't aware of how the business operates, has misguided views to how much those shares are worth. And it creates this really, really unpleasant, uncomfortable situation. And the other guys lose control of the business, right? Because at 25%, she can, generally speaking, veto certain decisions. So it makes life very challenging, right? So what shareholder protection does, essentially it provides both the money and the mechanism to avoid that happening. So the way it works is you take out individual insurance contracts on the people. And what you do is you'd have a cross option agreement, which determines the mechanism for valuing those shares. That tells you how much insurance you need for each person. And then the policies essentially provide the protection, the mechanism. So what it's doing there is it's providing a fair and just valuation for the shares which stops this ambiguity when, the, when the, the worst happens about how much it's actually worth because the mechanism has already been put in place and signed into by all the shareholders. So it stops there being any ambiguity or, or misunderstandings. And what it does, it ensures that the money's available to meet that need. So essentially what happens is if I died, the shares still go to Joanne. It doesn't change that fact. But what happens is there is an agreement in place which forces Joanne to sell to you guys because you guys then have the money paid to the business from the insurance contract and there's an exchange, she gets the money, my family is supported, you guys get the shares back and retain control of the business. Super simple. So simple. Question, question for you, Matt. See, with that yep. payment, um, is there tax relief? Well, would the, the wife have to pay tax on that income? Um, no, essentially, I'm pretty sure it doesn't because um, I believe it falls, because essentially she's inheriting the shares. It all comes down to the world. So, um, that's a really good question. I'm trying to think now. Um, it would probably form part of the estate. So what you do is you put it in trust, wouldn't you? It would need to be in trust to keep it, it out have, of the it estate. Have to, it, it would have to be anyway for the business because it would have to be in a business trust anyway. Um, so I imagine, I'll find out for you. That's a really good question. I haven't even thought about that. Taxation on benefits of spouse. I'm writing this down, mate. I'll find out and I'll drop down a message or put it on the Facebook group. No Great problem. question. Um, yeah, really good question. I'll find out. But essentially, I imagine at that point, that's for the shareholder themselves to understand what the tax implications of that benefit would look like and putting provisions in place accordingly. But essentially, yeah. it'd be like, because you've inherited the shares, I, I wouldn't think there would be, because if you can imagine, the shares have a nominal value at the point that I inherit them. So it would have naturally formed part of my estate. I would have inherited the shares already and they have a, a fixed valuation based on that mechanism we've already agreed. So essentially I wouldn't be profiting or losing because I've already inherited shares worth the value of the insurance contract, if that makes sense. Yeah, but if it falls into the estate, um, then there's, you could end up with a 40% liability on IHT. Potentially, but if it's, yeah. So I imagine that, that, that would be yeah. my fear on it. Um, obviously, if, it, if it's 
paid to the business um, and it's not part of your estate. And is it like obviously if you're giving them to your wife as as not part or they're in trust, those shares are in trust for the business um, and it's not part of your estate, then there wouldn't be any IHT. But if you're then giving the money to the partner, um, yeah. then she's get it, then would she be in, would she be hit with capital gains tax? Uh, or some other form of tax? In in theory, no. But it is a good question. I need to clear that up. And again, I suppose it depends on the value of the shares yeah. and whether yeah, you push them beyond the uh, IHT yeah. threshold. But again, obviously, you've got personal allowances. But I'm I'm pretty sure you get business relief anyway on that one. But I'll find out. I'll have a look. I'll, I'll yeah, have a no, I've just thought about it. But no, that's, that's great. Thanks. No, it's a pleasure. It's, it's, it is a very good question, actually. It's one of the best I've had yet. Um, I'll find out. Find out. But um, yeah, essentially, you're absolutely right. So the, the money gets provided to the business. The business has the mechanism for agreeing the value of the shares and passing it back. Now, the things to be careful about with this one, obviously, making sure you've got that cross option agreement in place. If you don't have that, it's game over. It doesn't happen, right? Because there is no obligation on either party to do anything. If you have critical illness built into that contract as well, you'd go for a single option agreement because you wouldn't be doing the transaction necessarily in the event of death. There'd be a decision to be made by the shareholder and they determine that at the beginning within the shareholder agreement as to whether if that person gets a critical illness do they get to retain the shares because they might not want to sell them so really the purpose of this is an event of death but if you include critical illness there needs to be decisions between the shareholders so between the four of us for example we'd go well look what you know if i've got cancer i probably want to keep the shares because i could probably still do bits of work you go oh, okay fair enough but it's death that i'm worried about but if it's mental incapacity for example or maybe yeah you know so you'd have You'd have it clearly explicitly drawn out between us as shareholders within our shareholder agreement, what that looks like. And then you determine whether it's a cross option or single option agreement. So cross option is life. Single option is if it's a critical illness bit as well, where I want to retain the shares. Um, again, sounds really complex. It's actually not, believe it or not, because it's not up to you again to make sure that stuff's in place. You'd want to make sure that the company has the relevant documents checked over by their solicitor or someone who's responsible for making sure that it doesn't conflict with the shareholders agreement or anything else they've got in place already, because that can often happen. But again, I want to go back to my point, which is you as the advisor is simply, and again, it's a really good point, Mark, but I guess my response would be as the advisor, look, tax implications, that's your bag. You need to worry about that, right? I'm here to provide you the money you need to do the transaction. If mm -hmm. that then means there's a separate advice piece needed for the family of uh, the deceased to make sure that they've got it set up correctly, absolutely. But from a business point of view, I'm giving you the money you need to buy those shares back and the mechanism to make sure it happens. So retain business control for you guys to have business continuity. So I keep going back to this weird point, and it's only because this is where all advisors go wrong. We all overcomplicate it. Oh, cross options, all this, all shareholders, all taxation, right? Most of it isn't your concern. It's about saying, look, the cross option agreement and the shareholder agreement, that's, that's the lawyer's concern. Tax treatment of benefit and premiums, that's the, the accountant's concern. My job is very simple. There is a need, a fiscal need of X, and I'm providing you with a policy that gives it to you. That's it. Does that make sense? And I think this is where most advisors really get scared out of doing business protection because they look at the complexity and go, oh, my God, and if I get it wrong, and you're generally talking big sums assured, and you think, shit, if I get this wrong, it's going to be serious. It's never that, a problem. That, I think that probably answers Mark's question, doesn't it, in that yeah. sense, that... It's kind of you're just providing a service after that, after they've got the money, that's that's your job done. Kind of. But, but Mark's, Mark's being a responsible advisor there by signposting the issue. And I think that's absolutely the point. If you are a if you are a holistic advisor, you do your job properly. Of course, you're going to signpost that risk and you might want to have a solution in place to deal with it. But you're right, Dan. It, essentially, this is where advisors are going wrong. And again, another point. Right. Don't ever value a business ever. None of us on this call are qualified to value. Well, your mom might be wrong. Please correct me. But I don't think anyone on this call is qualified to value a business. You can use a calculator. You can use well, five times net profits, right? Something like that. But generally speaking, there's so many complexities in terms of valuing a business. That's the job of the accountant again, or a company that specializes in it. And you say, look, in terms of valuing these shares, I need to know what your business is worth. And you get them to tell you. I need to know what level of cover to put in place to meet the shareholder requirement, but you need to tell me what your company's worth and watch it. Honestly, they'll go, ah, oh, two million quid. And you look into it, it's worth half a million quid. But the point there is it's up to them to provide the figure. 
And that way you're never going to fall foul of under or over insuring them because they've determined the value. And you want that in writing. Does that make sense? You, you never want to be valuing the business. Provide them with guidance, but say, look, it's up to you to validate the value of this because if it goes wrong, that's on you. I'm just giving you the money. And that is how you move away from being one of these people who say, I'm so scared of business protection because it's so frightening and there's so, so much complexity to, no, do you know what? You just need some money if this happens. You just need some money. For, do you want to know something, right? Here's a real simple thing. Executive income protection, relevant life cover, shareholder protection, loan protection, and key man insurance, they're all term assurance contracts. All of them. Exactly the same as mortgage life insurance or normal income protection. They're all exactly the same thing. They might be branded this or branded that, but essentially all you're saying is, right, if that happens, I need money. How long do you need to cover for that term? Brilliant. There you go. That's it. It's all it is. Just to 67, to 50, to five years, whatever it is, it's all the same stuff. It's term assurance contracts. So don't be scared. And I know the names sound pretty complex and it all sounds really complex when you're talking about valuations and tax treatment, but just get it down to the simple stuff, which is right. How much money do you need if that guy dies? How much money do you need if that guy dies? Oh, and if Dan dies tomorrow, what happens to his shares? Do we need to make sure you can buy them back off his wife? Yeah, okay, perfect. Bang, job. Does that make sense? All that's all you're doing is a business protection advisor. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't get caught up in the nonsense. I and mean, what you've just done there, Mark, is brilliant because you've asked me a very complex question. It's kind of thrown me a little bit and you go, brilliant, okay. But all you're doing at the same is really good question. Let me find out if you and I'll get back to you on that one. Off you go, go and get the answer. Speak to your BDM. Get them to tell you what to do and then go back to the client. I just don't overcomplicate it. You just need to provide the financial solution to the business. And then the final one you need to know about is loan protection, which again, quite simple. But there's a couple of things you can look out for with regards to loan protection. So where anyone's got a commercial loan or uh, anyone's bought their own premises or has debts, even bounce back loans, by the way, bounce back loans are debts that need protecting because they still have to be paid back. Appreciate that, you know, there's, there's not, not necessarily guarantees behind them, but they still have to be paid back. They're on the books. But again, also another thing, director's loan accounts. You know, I've got a massive director's loan account with the business because I, of course, pump loads of money in when we set the business up and I haven't took it out yet because I want to trickle it through for tax reasons. But that is immediately repayable upon my death, you know. If I die tomorrow, the business has to pay that back to Joanne without fail, legally, overnight. She can go, right, money, money in the hand. Any director's loan account has to be repaid back immediately upon death. So any business owner that's got director's loan account, when you go through their accounts, first thing is, right, dude, that's got to be protected. And treat everything separately. Well, that thing about. is a big one for that, then, isn't it, at the moment? That's a big well, kind of... Massively, man. Massively. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much every business is took a bounce back loan, right? Pretty much every one, and you'd be mad not to. It's, just, it's practically free money. Yeah. The point there is that anyone you speak to, if, you know, if you've got a bounce back loan, you ought to be aware that that has to be protected or you can put a post out. Did you know director's loan accounts have to be repaid immediately beyond death? Lots of people sit with hundreds of thousands in director's loan accounts, you know. Just drawing bits out for tax reasons, just here and there when they want to, because they're in growth phase. Um, I have a couple of customers with £50,000 worth in their bank just holding it in there just to keep their businesses afloat at the moment. There you go. So it's just, you know, th those have to be protected because what people don't realise is like, it, honestly, again, if we had the four of us had a business and I died tomorrow and I had 100 grand in my director's loan account, Joanne just sits there, puts her hand out and you guys have to pay it. You can't not pay it, otherwise she could bankrupt you. And she's entitled to it. It's, it's her money at the end of the day because she's inherited that liability. Mm. So it, these are frightening things that people don't realize, but what it does mean for you guys as advisors, it's just a wealth of opportunity. There's a wealth of entry points and pain points for businesses that they just don't realize. So what I'd say on that, on that basis is just treat them in isolation, go through the various different processes and look at them. I would always start with things like relevant life and executive income protection as gateway products because they're easy to understand they're easy to account for. They're easy to recommend. They're easy to set up. They're not overly complicated. And what it does, it allows you to build that rapport with the business owner. And particularly if they've got multiple shareholders, it's great because you start with one and then he goes back to his board and goes, oh, by the way, Matt's just done my personal stuff and put it on expenses. And he usually has to get them to ratify it. And then they go, oh, we'd like that. And before you know it, you're sat in front of a board of directors going, oh, right, well, you've got shareholder protection to worry about. You've got loan protection to worry about. You've got key people in your business. 
Um, that's where the commission really starts to roll in, I'd, I'd guess. Oh, it's it, it, it's ridiculous. You know, I've known advisors earn like 90 grand a month doing business protection just off a couple <laughs> right. of contracts. It's not ridiculous. It's not, it's not obscene to expect that you can't do that, quite it's, honestly. It's just talking to the right people, isn't it, I guess? Yeah, but the, the weirdest ones are that you start off with something you think's like neither here nor there, and it just kind of goes on and on and on and on and on. Now, imagine a business that's turning over one or two million quid. And you're saying to them, look, for the sake of two or three grand a month, I can put all these policies in place, which essentially secure your business continuity. Now, all this money you're generating is income for the business and you're drawing out and you're living on because they're on 150 grand salaries. It's effectively incumbent on the business carrying on. Right. If anything disrupts that business or disrupts the flow of the business or you have cash flow issues, it could really seriously inhibit the ability of the business to continue trading. So I'm going to put these policies in place. Now, if this is turning over a million pound, they're going to think twice about 24 grand in, in insurance premiums, particularly if some of it could be put on expenses. I and mean, we're not even going to think about it. Mm. And now that's 40 grand, right? It's 40 grand a net commission. And you're going, right, I'll get that every month. Mm. That's not unrealistic, quite honestly. That's not unrealistic at all. Obviously, you've got to get in front of the right people. But bear, bear in mind this. You get in front of a company, think about this as an opportunity. You sit in front of a company, the first thing you need to do is you're going to get their accountant or their solicitor to ratify the valuations and the shareholders' agreements, right? And you go to them, listen, you know, I've helped this business. You've got anyone else that you think I ought to speak to? Bang. They open the door to a load more people. Speaking of the business owners, you know, we've done this for you, right? Are there any customers, suppliers, or business contacts you've got that you think ought to speak to us? Now, think what he's thinking here. If he's got suppliers or clients, particularly clients who are on credit terms, and he's thinking to himself, it wouldn't hurt to make sure their business is secure because they pay me on credit term, right? And you go, right, do me a favor, do me an intro into your client and I'll have a chat to them about this as well. And all of a sudden, it's like doors just start opening like that. It's just about being a bit dynamic with the way you think. So the first thing I'd say is most of you here are probably self-employed. Is that fair to say? Most of you self-employed? You have your own accountant, right? Straight away. Hello, I'm doing this, <laughs> right? Now with accountants, Accountants are your best introducers by far, but I want to be really clear about this. That'll be a slow burn with accountants. Your own will be all right because you can start with them, but other accountants is a slow burn. You have to build trust with accountants really badly because I guarantee you either they get bombarded by business protection advisors all the time or they're just, they've got their own agenda, right? They're worried about their own clients, not worried about you or your income or what you're going to offer them. And some accountants are really receptive to being offered commission and some are just not interested. What they want to do is the right thing for the customer. One of the things I've used with accountants that works really well is I've said to them, look, at the end of the day, your business, your business model relies on your clients operating efficiently and remaining in business. Right. So part of what I'm doing here is actually ring fencing your own business by protecting your clients. And they go, oh, that's interesting. And then, of course, what you do is you sit down and explain it to them. Now, I will say this. Offer clinics, webinars. Just say, look, if you want to, why don't I do a session on key man insurance for your clients? Get them to book a webinar, just like we're doing now. Get nine or ten business owners on there and talk about key man insurance. Who are key men? Why might you want key man insurance? How does it work? How does it protect the business? You know, do a little session on it. Um, I can give you plenty of stuff to use. I've got product fact sheets you can use. I've given loads of product fact sheets explaining what the different cover works, but you've got to be on them. Another thing that works really, really well is if you ever do a policy for a business, do a case study. So do an example, put it on LinkedIn. I've just helped a business, da, 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 da. This is what I did. This was the risks. This is the cover I put in place for them. Is this you? Do you need to speak to me about this? And what you do is you tag in all your introduced, all your accountants or your solicitors or your bookkeepers or your commercial loan broker, your commercial insurance brokers in that post. Because what happens then is you introduce us, see the case study and think, oh, I've just done I've just done that for Johnny. And then you get an introduction that way. It's quite organic. and It works really, really well, because what you're doing is you're triggering this thought process for them to identify how that relates to a very similar customer that they have that they're dealing with right now. Commercial insurance brokers are dealing with companies all the time. They know how insurance works and they do not do business protection. They're generally insurance contract providers. They don't do protection. So partner with a commercial insurance broker, find one near you, say, look, oh, let's do a reciprocal deal. 
you send me business protection leads, I'll send you corporate leads. So when I get business protection ones, I'll send them back to you for, for, uh, for the business quotes, for your business insurance quotes. Uh, do that commercial loan brokers. My God, they're writing debts all day long. And it, I don't know if you know this, but in most commercial loan contracts, it states quite clearly in the offer, you must have sufficient insurance in place within the business to cover any guarantees or debts. And it's like nobody actually enforces it. You know, like on personal protection, you get a mortgage. There's nothing in there that says you have to have insurance. It just says, we advise you consider insurance to cover the debt or something along those lines if it's one of the decent lenders. But it's not mandatory. In business, it is. They actually put it in the offer, yet nobody does it. They don't even check it. That's how stupid it is. But what that means is you can get in with commercial loan brokers and go, look, you're missing a trick here, guys, because all you've got to do is signpost this clause, send them to me, and I'll give you a cut. Boom. Loads of opportunity there to just get them to partner with you. Uh, commercial loan brokers, like I say, really, really good one. Um, bookkeepers, accountants, solicitors, dealing with company mergers, acquisitions, appointment of directors, recruitment companies that deal with appointments of directors. New director comes in, particularly for taking shares or equity. You know, do you need this? Um, venture capitalists. If you've got venture capitalists and they're, they're introducing people and putting loans into businesses or advancing them capital for expansion or anything like that, the first thing they're going to want to know is that their investment's safe. They're going to want to know that the business has got sufficient protection in place, key man insurance. They will insist on it. And most companies go, yeah, yeah, we got it. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, 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 we got it. They never do it. But say to the venture capitalists, look, I tell you, how, how about we partner and I'll make sure it's in place and I will get agreement from the owners to provide you with a report to show it's been put in place. So they get that security, right? There's all, I mean, I'm not being funny. There's all these opportunities. I'm like scratching the surface here in terms of opportunities. Six what, what, million. Just, sorry, oh. sorry to interrupt, Matt. Um, right? What did you say the, the best one to go in with is? And then you can kind of go from there. Did you, did you mention that? Accountants. Accountants, the best yeah. one, and offer them relevant life. Relevant oh, life. Relevant life. Was that the, the, the in? Is that the best one to go in with? The relevant, relevant life and exec IP. Right. right. So with accountants, turn around and say to the accountants, would you be interested in doing a campaign to your clients about uh, arranging their own private furlough scheme paid for by the business? Damn. Or death in service, but done privately paid for by the business, fully tax efficient. Right, as an employee benefit. Now think about this for a minute, just if you can picture this for a minute, think about the positioning. Most companies out there right now are worried because it's a torrid time. They might lose key staff. Things are all a bit up in the air. You've got very unhappy people. It's all a bit mental, isn't it? And you turn around and you go, right, what most firms are doing now are considering how they can offer additional value to their employees. Have you considered offering a permanent furlough scheme or permanent sick pay for your staff? Have you considered offering life insurance for your staff, all tax efficient, paid for by the business to reduce your corporate tax liability? Mm. Wow. Now, if you're dealing with accountants and they're looking at people, because this is happening, right? Every person, tell me you don't do this to your own accountant. How can I reduce my tax liability? How can I save on my tax? Tell me you don't do that to your accountant, because if you don't, you need shooting. But we all do it, right? We all go and speak to our accountants. It's true, though, isn't it? Who wants to pay tax? Mm -hmm. Who wants to pay tax? So you're, you're putting your accountant under pressure to reduce your corporate tax liability or reduce your income tax liability or whatever it is. And then you've got lots of accountants looking to save their clients money. And you go in with an option and go, listen, how about this? How about this? If your clients have got anything like income protection or life cover that they're currently paying for personally, they're first having to draw the money out of the business, pay NI, P11D, or even income tax on it. And then what they're having to do is pay insurance premium tax on top. How about you go out to them with a campaign to say, I've got a guy here who can help you put any personal expenses, uh, personal cover on expenses, sorry, and you could arrange your own personal private furlough scheme paid for by the business. Come on. Your own personal private furlough scheme paid for by the business. Where do I sign, right? Tax efficient, tax deductible, reduces your corporate tax liability, means you've always got an income, you and your family are safe, company pays for it, boom, permanent sick pay. And it's not just COVID, it's cancer, stroke, stress, anything that stops you working. Yeah, brilliant, sign me up. Now imagine you can give that as a tool to your accountant and think about it from the accountant's point of view. He's now not just helping to find ways to reduce their corporate tax liability, 
but also save them personally money by putting their cover on expenses. But he's offering additional value that the guy down the road doesn't. He's being a holistic accountant now. He's going, oh, I've got some stuff here I can help you with. It's not just that. And then when you speak to the company, they go, look, you know, all this stuff we're doing for you here. Have you thought about offering any of that to your staff to retain the good ones? So if you've got really good people in the business, have you thought about offering them their own private furlough scheme? And the business can pay for it. It's all, again, tax deductible. Think about that, because if they're an employee of the company, you can do it. It doesn't have to be a director. Any employee of the UK Limited Company can, can get executive income protection. Any employee of a sole trader or a partnership of their PAYE can get executive income protection. Anyone that's an employee can get it, regardless of the corporate structure. So what you're saying there is, would you like to arrange permanent private furlough for your staff as well, put on expenses? And then you go, right, it's an employee benefit then. Employee benefit, life cover, IP, fantastic. And you go, but given they're key people, would it not make sense to sort of protect them as well so the business gets money if something happens to them? So I know you've got this policy and pay them, wouldn't you need the money to replace them? So should we get some profit protection for you as well? Bang, before you know it, you've ramped it all up, right? And you're doing two grand of premiums and there's 40 grand in the bank and you're going on holiday. Simple. But yeah, gateway products, gateway products, getting through the door, find the avenues, find the little tools you can use to get in with the accountants. But remember with accountants, it is a slow burn. But for starters, I guarantee all of you will have companies that you work with already. You probably won't realize because they're probably just company directors or self-employed company owners or something. And you probably haven't even realized it. And you're probably dealing with them on a daily basis, doing mortgages for them. Go back to them and go, listen, I've had an idea, right? How about we put you income protection, your permanent private furlough on expenses. The business can pay for it. How does that sound? Brilliant. Bang, straight away you're in. And honestly, the premiums on exec IP, my average is about 180 quid a month. And people, that, they don't care. It's so much more cost effective because to pay 108, okay, let's assume it's 100 quid personally. To pay that, you've got to draw 180 quid out of the business anyway. So you don't have to pay tax on it, national insurance, then you've got to get the money, then you've got to pay IPT. Before you know it, to get 100 quid, you don't have to draw 180 out of the business anyway. But the business can pay for it and it's tax efficient. So think about roots in. Right, roots in, just get in with people, start with the gateway products and then open up the portfolio to them. It may be that you don't do it in one go. You may just start off with the personal stuff and then come back to them in six months and go, I've been reviewing your stuff. I think we ought to speak or even say, when's your end of year? Say, should we, should we book your calling for the end of the year and I can have a look at your stuff? Because if you're making money, it might make sense to put some of these things in place to protect the business. You know, just pull them back in. You don't have to do it all in one go. But just think about getting in there and building that rapport with them, building that relationship and then ask them for referrals as well. Because all company owners hang around with other company owners. All company owners have company suppliers and company clients and other accountants and people they deal with. A couple of warnings though, networking groups. Um, be very wary of networking groups because you'll find they're probably not the ideal type of corporate client you want. And also be very wary of startup businesses. We all know like, you know, 95% of startup businesses tend to fail within the first five years. So just be wary of that. If you're dealing with solicitors that deal with company corporations, because I know some people target them, just be mindful of the fact that you might end up writing a load of business and it's just falling off again quickly because the company goes under regardless. And it won't be down to one of them getting ill or dying. It'll be because the company didn't have a valid or viable business model. Um, but just be wary of that sort of stuff. So tend to aim for Companies that are going through a growth curve, companies that are expanding, companies that are stable, companies that are at that point where actually, do you know what, the business owner, let's say me, for example, I've done four or five years in business. I'm starting to see the fruits of my labor come to, come to fruition. I'm thinking, yeah, we're going through an expansion phase now. That's when I'm at my most risk. I'm about to absorb liabilities, employees, issues, right? And you kind of think that's the ideal moment to get in. You can use, um, I'll put it in the chat actually, bizdb, bizdb.co.uk, I think that's it. That's a great database for finding potential corporate clients. Um, I've seen a couple of, in fact, Legal in general recommend using that as well in one of their presentations. That's a really good database for getting companies. Bye, Jenny. Um, Bye, Jenny. See, see you later. later. See you later. Um, yeah, so that's a really good database for getting company information. And often you can download a lot of the accounts information from there as well. So it can highlight if there's any corporate loans in the background, how many shareholders, directors there are. Um, you can also see what their liabilities look like. 
can see if there's any loans in the background. So often company accounts give you everything you need to go in. And I think I was reading somewhere that um, I just think like 75% of business owners that were surveyed by legal in general said that they would be very, very interested in taking up business protection if someone approached them about it once they learned what the products were. But they don't know about it, do they? Of course they don't. You're talking to them about it. Yeah. And then when people, please don't take this the wrong way, but people go into them and they're sitting there in a stuffy shirt and tie going, oh, hello, I'm Corporate Colin and I'm here to talk to you about business protection. And it's like business owners are like, what, mate? What are you going on about? You've got to go in there with a bit of charisma and a bit of passion. Don't be wrong, you've got to have acumen. You've got to be able to understand how a business works. You understand what P&L looks like and balance sheets and what the company's doing. But fundamentally, as you know, Mark and I were sort of talking about a minute ago, you kind of just got to keep it really simple. Of course, it's going to be complex questions involved. But what you're really trying to say is, look, there are some inherent risks in running a business. And actually, when you're talking about dealing with mortgage clients or protection clients in the personal space, Remember, if they're, if they're working for a business or run their own business and that's how they generate their income, that company and the success of that company is the thing, the very thing that funds their lifestyle. So if they, if they don't see the need to protect the business, the business is the lifeblood. The business is the thing that I, mean, I, I, I don't earn money by just earning money. I earn money because I draw it out of my company. So if my company folds tomorrow, my income stops. Can't afford my mortgage, can't live. Regardless of what contracts I've got, so I can have personal income protection, but if the company fails, I don't earn money anyway. I can't claim for the company failing. Mm. So you're best off protecting the business and its profitability and its ability to continue. And most companies, right, most companies know, they absolutely know they ought to be sorting out their succession planning, but just don't. And what you're doing is you're going in there and you're triggering this thought process and saying, look, Really, the purpose of me coming here today is to help you with your succession planning. I'm here to make sure that this business can carry on trading regardless, that, it, that you can retain control of it in the event of something happening, that it's not going to just fold if someone key within the business dies or gets seriously ill. I'm going to make sure that you've always got the cash you need to stay buoyant and continue trading so that you can, you can continue to meet your responsibilities, not just to yourselves, but your employees as well. Because if someone came to me and said to me as a business owner, you know, you've got seven staff, Matt, right, employees. They've got families and mortgages and children, and I'm responsible for them. But I'm going to make sure that you've got the money you need to continue to meet those obligations. I'll be like, all right, all right, we'll talk. And we're going to make the business pay for it. Ooh, okay, I'm interested. Does that make sense? Keep it super simple. Keep it positive. Keep it all about meeting this issue they probably didn't even know they've got. It's funny, isn't it, how we'll all go and take out insur life insurance for ourselves and we'll take out, you know, critical illness cover, but we won't actually think about protecting the very thing that gives us the money we used to pay for it. Weird, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's the, that's the difference as well, making it relatable to them and the fact that it's their, it's their income at the end of the day. Like I say, if you're not protecting the business, it's, it's their income that they're going to lose. But you know, it's, so, it's so much more than that as well, though, isn't it? I mean, if you think about what you do, Dan or Ash, or how long you guys have spent building your brand, your company, your name, your everything you're doing, right? It's the lifeblood, isn't it? It's, it's not even just the money. It's what that business means to you. If you've put your heart and soul on the line and you've put your house up to raise the capital to build your business and you could lose it like that because a guy you employ gets cancer, well, that's ridiculous, isn't it? It's like, it's not, that's not contingency planning. That's just me just winging it and hoping for the best. But who wants to take that chance? Who wants to take the chance they could lose everything they've worked so hard for? Mm. Yeah, 100%. It's, uh, it's been an eye-opener, I think, oh, for me, anyway. I'm sorry, I've completely waffled on for like an hour. Has anyone got any like specific questions or anything you want to ask me about? Um, no, you're, you're very good at what you do. Oh, you're so sweet, Mark. <laughs> I'm going to reach out and give you a hug. There you go. I'm going for the grizzly look at the minute too. So. <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm very good at what I do, mate. To be honest with you, we were having this conversation with a guy at work today. I've got a new guy joining me called Jason. I was training him today. And he was having a conversation with a client. And I could, I could tell he was being a bit reticent on the call. And I said, after the call, I said, what, what, what was so bad about that call, mate? And he's like, we did a bit of analysis. And I said, look, I'm not trying to be critical, but you didn't speak with any conviction to the guy. Like the guy was going, I want unemployment insurance. He's going, but you see, but he's trying to convince this guy not to have unemployment insurance. 
I said, mate, I'd have shot that bloke down. I'd have just turned around and gone, listen, pal, right? I am not a search engine. We're not here having a, a you tell me what you want and I'll, I'll, I'll meet the order for you. I'm an advisor, a professional, just like you're a marketeer. I wouldn't come to you and say, no, I want to do this campaign and this is how it's going to go. Otherwise, I'd do it myself. What's happening here is you've come to me for advice. Now, you've inquired about unemployment insurance, but let me get to the bottom, the nitty gritty of what's wrong. And I said, the reason you're inquiring about unemployment insurance is because you're worried that if you lose your job, your income stops. So would it be fair to say the thing we're really worried about is your income stopping? Yeah. OK, good. Well, let me put something to you. If you lose your job, chances are you'll get severance pay. Chances are you'll find some other form of work because you're able-bodied. There's nothing stopping you working. And it might not be the job you want to do. You might end up stacking shelves at Tesco or picking fruit down the road. But the fact is you're able-bodied, which means it's within your power to go and find other gainful employment. The, that's not the issue at all, mate. The issue is if you can't work. It doesn't matter if you've got this job or no job. If you can't work, you're screwed because the income you're so worried about would stop. So we're going to do income protection and this is how we're going to do it. And I'm advising you, right? It's a very different kind of conversation. And it's really funny because afterwards he went, you're right, I've just got to have a bit more courage of conviction. And I think this is where as advisors, we make massive mistakes. When we're speaking to customers, we kind of take on board what they want and we kind of try and meet the need and we're worried about skirting around certain things. The best conversations I've ever had with clients has been where I've gone into a conversation and I've had this courage of conviction in terms of what I believe is the right solution. And I speak with authority because that's what they value. And I do it on a level. Like I'm not talking technical stuff or jargon or shite. I don't even go through the key facts. I know it's probably really bad from a compliance point of view, but I don't go through key facts documents with them because I've first got to engage them in what we're talking about. I've got to get them to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it and why it's so important. And then you go, right, and here's a document you can read at your leisure. But fundamentally, look, the facts are we're just trying to raise money if this happens. And I think it's very kind what you said, Mark. But I think, to be honest with you, the only reason that advisors struggle is because they don't speak with any level of conviction. Like they don't they don't believe in what they're talking about, particularly because they believe it's like, oh, God, if I say the wrong thing, I'm in trouble. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Right. The, the more. The more direct you are with your advice and the more you recommend, the more confidence the client has in what you're saying. Like I was reading through this guy's demands and needs letter early and it was like, Irene, it was going, it's very washy. It's like he's trying not to say anything that might be construed as advice. And I'm going, what do you think these people have come to you for? What do you think they've come to you for? For chat or for you to place their order? They've come because they want you to advise them. They want you to tell them what they actually need. Because they're just shopping around the internet. Oh, I don't really know what I'm looking for. I need life insurance. No, you don't, mate. You're a sole mortgagee with no dependents. You don't need life insurance. Unless you want to leave the house to me. No, great, you don't need life insurance then. What you need is money in the bank every month. It's a bit like Rishi Sunak, right? He didn't turn around and go, here's 50 grand, everybody. Best of luck to you. He said, no, every month I'm going to give you an income. Why? Well, because the bills don't stop, do they? Like, it's all this simple stuff. And if you talk to clients like that without being condescending, of course, I think that's where you get true engagement. And it's no different for business clients. Business owners have so much shit to deal with on a daily basis, running their businesses and dealing with all this stuff. They lose sight of the fact that if something goes wrong, they're in real trouble. So you're going to do is going to go, listen, I know you probably don't want to hear this, but the fact is there's a couple of risks within the business. But listen, you don't need to worry. I'm going to take care of it all. I'm going to make sure you've got the money you need when you need it. And the same way you do with the personal policy. This is what I'm going to recommend you have. I'll look at some different options for you. We'll start with that. If you want to adjust it, that's fine. If it comes down to budget, we can always reduce the levels. But at least you'll have what you need from a cash point of view. If that person dies or if that person gets ill or that happens or this happens, right? I'll sort it out for you. I'll take care of everything. Don't worry about it. How does that sound? Perfect. Brilliant. And they just want to know it's going to be dealt with. This company I'm dealing with right now, I swear to God, they're not even bothered about premiums. They're just like, do me a favor. Can you just fix this problem for us? Because the investor wants to know we've got cover. Can you just sort it? And I'm like, yeah, but it's going to cost you like three grand a month. And I'm like, no, oh, whatever. Just can you just sort it for me, please? That's, that's how it works, right? Just get in there, speak to them, be positive, be sincere, be confident. Don't worry about saying the wrong thing because you can always pick up later. You know, just pick it later. Later on, go, oh, don't worry, the accountant will sort that out for you. The solicitor will sort that out for you. Hope that's helped anyway. Yeah. No, people just need that, um, 
need to see that you are an expert in your field and that kind of projects trust onto them doesn't it so they they think yeah this guy knows his shit he knows what he's talking about I'll, i trust this guy if he's advising me not getting led into whatever they're saying they want and taking taking ownership of it like you say yeah, it's really weird, Dan. It's like I was chatting to this guy today and he, I said to him, look, if you think about the clients, so we're getting leads through from a website at the minute and they're probably getting contacted by four or five other people at the same time because they, they, you know what people do? They fill in loads of forms to get the quotes, don't they? Yeah. And I said, think, think about the interactions they're having with other businesses and how you differentiate yourself. And I was saying, most people are phoning them up, right? And they're going, hello, Mr. Jones, I can see you've just filled in a form and you, would you like some quotes for this? Exactly just, the same, the problem, everyone. Right? It's, it's, same scripted monotone bullshit, right? Yeah. And I phone people up and go, listen, I can see you've inquired. I'm sure you've probably had loads and loads of calls. First things first, right? I just want to introduce myself and let you know how I might be able to help you. But really, I'm calling just to answer any questions you've got, explain how the cover works, kind of chat through your different options. And if you want me to, at the end of the day, I can give you some quotes. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. You know, I'm just here to provide a bit of guidance and advice. You know, at the end of the day, you can go with anyone you want to. There's no obligation to use me. But hopefully, at the end of this call, you'll feel a bit more informed about your choices. Straight away, it's a guaranteed sale. Guaranteed sale. Because they're looking thinking, this bloke's not trying to sell me anything. He's just giving me information. And I spend time giving them information. I tell them things that, that no other advisor probably would. Like unemployment insurance isn't worth the paper it's written on, right? It's not worth the paper it's written on. By the time you get that 30-day exclusion paid, you'll be in work. You're better off putting money into the mattress. What you are, what you ought to be doing is taking out income protection. Here's an interesting one for you, income protection, right? If you get wind that you might be losing your job, why don't you go and see your doctor and tell him you're feeling really anxious and get signed off for stress and then get your income protection benefit paid. And that way unemployment insurance is redundant anyway. It's, forgive me, but this is how it works, right? I'm not saying go and commit insurance fraud, but what I am saying is this is the real world. And I had a client come to me last week and this is, this is the God's honest truth. He's going to shock you all. He, was, he had an accident and sickness policy with Aviva. And he's been paying £348 a month, a month for a 12 month AS plan. Yeah, seriously, paying three grand a week potential benefit. Now, the policy was due for renewal because it's, it's a general insurance contract, yeah, right? Yeah. We, we do term cover here. This guy had general insurance crap that renews every year, pays out a maximum of 12 months. Any claims, any issues, any changes in market policy, premiums go up or they decline the cover. As it happens, Aviva declined to renew this year, but just neglected to tell the client. So his policy was due for renewal on the 10th. He went and got diagnosed with cancer, lymphoid cancer on the 9th. Went to submit a claim the following week to find the policy hadn't renewed. His broker hadn't told him about it. And now he's got nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, if that was term assurance, it wouldn't have been a problem. It had just carried on. It would have just had yeah. the cover and it would have been underwritten at outset and he'd have had the benefit and would have been able to support him. As it happens, I've, I've submitted a complaint into Aviva about the broker and hopefully he's going to get some benefit anyway because I'm trying to pull a bit of weight with Aviva. But um, hopefully he'll get some benefit because it's the right thing to do because he was diagnosed on the 9th and the policy ended on the 10th. So in theory, we should be able to get him at least 12 months benefit. But the point there is it's about trying to do the right thing by the client. And I said to the guy, look, I'm not going to be able to get him cover because he's got cancer. I'm not going to be able to get him income protection. He's not my client. There's no fiscal benefit to me. I said, look, let me help you. Let me see what I can do because it's the right thing to do. Now, think about this. He's a dental practitioner that earns 330 grand a year. Who do you think he moves with? Who do you think his social circle is? And he's going to go, this dude is unreal, right? He's helped me out like no end. He's made phone calls for me. He's chased a viva. He's put a complaint to the FCA for this broker who didn't renew my policy and notify me. The guy, the other broker, told the bloke two days after the policy cancelled that he'd got no cover after he'd just been diagnosed with cancer. What a shit broker. And I'm saying we do our job properly, right? So you do stuff like that and people just go, oh, they're amazing. They're amazing. It's no different with businesses, right? I'm just, I'm just trying to give you examples because what we're trying to do here is give really good advice to people and give them really good service. So they feel like they're getting something. It's not just about the insurance contract. I did a, a piece a couple of weeks back with it was um, Red Ark, Christine Husbands, I think is the chief executive of Red Ark. I was with her on um, a, a seminar for cover. And we were saying, actually, do you know something? For most people, the fiscal benefit from a, an insurance contract isn't the real value. The real value comes when you submit a claim and you get support services that come with it. 
Just think about it this way. If you were diagnosed with cancer tomorrow, you'd have a myriad of questions, right? You just, you'd be like, what's this, how long am I going to be off work for? What's the treatment going to be? How's it going to work? What type of cancer is it? What are my options? That's the stuff that goes to the head, not how much money am I going to get? But that, that's the last thing you're worried about. You think, am I going to survive? What about my kids? It's all that crap. So the support services that come with a policy are where the real value is contained, not in the fiscal bit. And I think we, as advice, completely start of that. But when you're talking to business clients or you're talking to personal clients, that's the kind of stuff that sells a policy. Because you, you explain it like that, and you can look in the real world, this is what happens. And there's so many examples of how that can be a benefit to people. And when you're doing business protection contracts, essentially in some of them, all of the employees of the business get access to these benefits, like ARG Smart Health, for example. And then you start thinking, oh my God, well, that's an employee benefit. And that's another route in. Oh, it's not just a policy, you get employee benefits as well with it. So yeah, don't lose sight of the fact there's all these other ancillary things that you can do to add value to the work that you do and be very proud of what you do. In the day, I keep saying to people, I go on about this all the time and people think I'm really nerdy, but what other job can you say where you get up in the morning and you go, right, I'm going to go and make sure someone doesn't lose their house. I'm going to make sure someone's got everything they need financially. I'm going to make sure people are protected from financial ruin and I'm going to get paid thousands of pounds to do it. It's like a noble profession that pays a fortune. It's ridiculous. The best job in the world. So you're right. Sorry, I'm waffling on. Mic. Mic drop. Uh, Matt, Not tell yes, everybody mate. what you do, because I think you can obviously help people more um, past this uh, this hour or hour and... Okay, yeah, hour, of course. Hour, long run. But yeah, explain what exactly what you do and how you can... Yeah, fine. So it all came back from last year. So if any of you are with Primus, uh, Primus asked me to speak uh, last year to a load of advisors about income protection. So I did like an IP masterclass for them, just explaining how you can approach mortgage protection sales differently and guarantee yourself a protection sale whilst doing the right thing for the customer. Because um, as I say, most mortgage advisors tend to do decreasing term life and kick off the back of a mortgage, which here, here's a scary stat for you. Only 2%, 2% of decreasing term kick payments actually go to clearing the mortgage debt. <laughs> Frightening. Just tells you the advice was crap to start with. But anyway, uh, they asked me to this IP masterclass, which worked really, really well. And then from the back of that, people started asking me if I could do sort of coaching sessions, private coaching sessions to help advisors get more confident, talk about protection, understanding how to speak to people, how to prioritise, cover that sort of stuff. And off the back of that, I ended up setting a consultancy business called MCAB. Um, and I just do regular scheduled courses. I do private coaching sessions as well, but I do um, regular training courses for various different aspects of protection. So business protection basics is one of them. Business protection masterclass is another where we go into a lot more detail, sales techniques, how to go and find introducers, Sort of stuff we've done tonight, but in a bit more detail and with a bit more um, show and tell. I do an IP masterclass, a mortgage protection course, uh, a family income benefit technical course, an income protection technical course, because my, my staple products are IP and FIB. I, they're my go-to. I go to them before anything else, because I don't know how you can worry about protecting debts until you worry about protecting the very source of the thing that gets the debts and pays for the debts. So I worry about income first and foremost, and then I help people understand how they build channels. And generally speaking, I try and help advisors double their protection sales because we talk about how we use those sales channels to kind of maximize the opportunities and make sure they're protecting people properly. Um, so that's kind of what I set up. So, yeah, like I say, you can do regular courses or you and you can pick and choose or you can do consultancy work. But by all means, if anyone's interested, you're more than welcome to go and check it out. It's mcab.uk is the website. There's a, a details of some of the courses on there and a, a calendar to book. And I think um, I've... Dan's negotiated and twisted my arm to offer some discount codes if people ever want to do any courses. So I'll happily send those on to Dan. He can forward them on to you if any of you are interested. But, you know, even if you just want to chat, you know, it's, it, there's no obligation. Like I say, it's just more uh, if you need help with anything, just give me a shout. If you want my advice or guidance or anything, I'm happy to give it. And then if you need any sort of more one to one or want to join any coaching courses or any of the scheduled courses, I can happily point you in the direction of the one that might be most appropriate. Oh, that's so good. Really interesting. You made it sound really easy. <laughs> it is easy. It's a piece. It's a piece of peace. <laughs> no, but it's it's the enthusiasm that you come across with that sells it too, yeah. Matt. At the end of the day, because you're passionate about it, um, enthusiasm mm -hmm. is it's just contagious. At the end of the day, um, 
if somebody's excited about it, if you think about your kids, if you tell them you're going to McDonald's because they want to go to McDonald's, they get excited. Um, and then you say, oh, you get happy too. Um, so uh, it, it is. Enthusiasm is, is, is a great way to, to motivate people to do things. Mm. And you got it in abundance. I'm Thank already you. thinking, where do I start? Where do I get a fact find? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll happily share a corporate fact find with you. I've got one. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Thank you. No, it's an absolute pleasure. I hope you found it interesting. Has anyone got any other questions about either the business protection or anything else you want to ask me whilst you got me on the call? Anything to do with protection, really? Anyone? No? Um, I'm just going to have to sign up for one, another one of your courses, Matt. That's all. You're more than welcome to. I'll be very grateful. I'll drop the link in the in the actual group, and then obviously, if anybody's got any questions after that, anyone thinks of. Um, just put them in there. Obviously, you're 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 in the group, aren't you, Matt? In the paid group. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the Facebook one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So if anyone's got any questions, just post it on there, and I'll answer anyway. You know, if there's anything to think of. Um, the ones if you guys put on, I mean, I know you're probably on here because you want to do business protection. By all means, I would do business protection. But what I would say is, if you want some quick wins, if you want to really make a difference quite quickly, if you guys are mortgage brokers primarily probably want to do the mortgage protection one and the IP masterclass because I will teach you how anyone that walks through your door, the first thing you do is get income protection in place and family can benefit before you even worry about touching the mortgage app. And I'll teach you how to do that through the right scripting and the right wording and the right process. And what happens then is even if the mortgage falls through, it doesn't matter. You've locked the client into the property they need because it's nothing to do with the mortgage. And all you're doing is you protect them in the right way. And then ultimately you've got them as a client. And then when they find the right property, the right one comes along or well, they get themselves into a position where they can get the mortgage. It's fine. And then what you do is you tell them mortgage protection. Mm. And it's like, what well, that does, it just doubles your protection cells and they treat it differently. It's what they call dissociation. So what they're doing is they're disassociating income cover from anything to do with the mortgage. So essentially it doubles their budget mm. and they don't even think about it. It's a totally different process. So that's a really good one for mortgage advice because not only will you double your protection sales and guarantee a sale, even if the mortgage doesn't go ahead, but actually you're doing the right thing. Because if you think if a client walks into you and wants a mortgage and for whatever reason you can't do it, are you just saying goodbye to them? Are you saying, well, bye, thanks, I'll speak to you when you are able to do a mortgage and you send them back to what rented accommodation may be. It's like you're completely missing out on an opportunity and you're potentially losing that client to another broker when they go and they finally do get themselves in a position to get a mortgage because you've got no connection or relationship with them. So I'll take that's one really good one for you guys, I would say, to really kind of get the most out of it. It's, it's things like income protection, which is probably more kind of um, valuable to renters anyway, isn't it? Then obviously oh, it's, it's important to, uh, to homeowners, but renters equally, if not more. It, it is the most important contract. I mean, let me ask you a quick question. If you've got critical illness or life insurance or private health insurance, how do you pay for it? With your income. So if you haven't protected your income, you can't very well protect anything else, can you? It's like, it's lunacy. It's just lunacy to me. So yeah, get the income protected first and then everything else falls into place. Everything else falls into place. Cool. Cheers, Matthew. Very much appreciated. Yeah, it's a pleasure. You. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. It's great to have you. Yes, yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, has anybody got any questions for anybody else, for me or Ross or Ash? Actually, uh, Big View or Big View, whatever you want to call it. Um, can you do the another way you segment it? How do you edit within Big View? Elaborate. Uh, I don't. I don't understand what you mean. Edit right. Um, well, I, I took the. I, I posted that video the other day. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Literally, all I did was read it out, do the th video, and there was bits I wanted to manipulate, for the want of a better word, um, and then do it that way, but couldn't, couldn't okay. suss it out. I'm going to ask you again, manipulate. And this is just only, I'm really going to keep asking because there's certain things you can do on it and there's certain things you can't. So. Right. So it's like, so if I, like, so start from, say, uh, what was it? So if I said the first two or three lines and then, I wanted to stop it and then start it maybe half a second or a second later and do another for another 20 seconds and then start and stop. So like if, you, if you wanna if you want to do that, you have to then put it into a third party editing app. You have okay. to edit it. Either you can't you can't edit it on Big View. To the okay. best of my knowledge. I mean I might be um I might be wrong, but like um 
because I haven't used it for a while. I haven't used it for a couple of weeks. They're updated something, but yeah, from my understanding, you'd have to throw it into a third party editing app. Um, one of the best ones for that is one called CapCut, which is CAP, CAP, CUT. It's free. It's an iPhone. Do you have an iPhone? Yeah. Yeah. So it's an iPhone. Um, you can just, as soon as you finish recording on Big View, you just press the transport to cap cut and it will it will do that um, and then what you is it you're trying to edit mark no it's, it's just uh, i got it uh, what was it the i wanted to do an intro and an outro uh, as well um, but whenever i put the intro on it um, it cut into where i was actually speaking and so the first say seven seconds and then obviously it, if somebody's got silent they're just going to literally look at it and read it anyway but if they do have it on volume then obviously I'm speaking a different part to what I was saying at the time. I just be so, careful. I think we we mentioned it a while back, but when you're kind of lengthening the video, it's just kind of putting intros and outros. Yeah. On on social media, it's best just to keep it as sh like as short and snappy, really, around would, a yeah. minute or two. But if you're kind of adding stuff on before and after, it's just kind of elongating the video, and there's no real value in that after that intro and outro so just yeah, i wouldn't me. add any i think dan's spot on like i wouldn't add anything to it like when it comes to um like social videos like the thing i've been doing recently like I'm, i do like a little test myself to, to keep it in less than 15 seconds like i'm like if it's less than if it's more than 15 seconds then i have to cut it <laughs> um and like have no no um branding on it obviously it's different if you're doing like a podcast there's, there's that's short form you know, like long form YouTube podcasting, that's a different thing, but like short form content. Well, see, the, the intention is to do a YouTube, have a maybe once a week a YouTube podcast type of thing that goes for maybe three to five minutes max, but probably do that. Um, and then get most of the content for everything else from that. Yeah, okay. So if you do that, you could use Big View for that. That's very hard to do though. So it's hard to, to maintain a five minute, three to five minute, um, scripted like teleprompter that's yeah. very hard that's very hard um i'd probably recommend the big view big view is amazing for like one minute or less like i've you i can use it for about 30 minutes i have done that but my god you're in a whole different world like you've got to be like a, a news reader <laughs> you know it changes the way like I, I wouldn't advise it i wouldn't advise it even for me you know i'll do it if 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 I get like um, commissioned to do something like a certain like like a, like a job, and they're like, "Can you talk about this specific topic?" and I've got to sound like I know what I'm talking about, then yeah, I will. I'll, I'll use it then. But like normally, I'd probably say with you, Mark, it's probably you're probably better by if you're going to do long videos, just standing and talking and um, recording them bit by bit. That's what. Yeah, and, uh, and then it, just uh, it, and then and then cut them together. Yeah, yeah. Like, great thing I use. I use like. If I do that, I mean, I'll use different things for loads of different reasons, but one thing you can use is if you're using your phone, you can just use something like this and it gives you a little Bluetooth zapper on it. And um, yeah. I just you sit, click, talk, 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 talk. As soon as you feel like you're going to stop again, stop, do it again, click, talk, 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 and then just throw it into an editor. Um, that's, I mean, so many ways around it, but that's what I would personally recommend. You know, okay. Do you know what I do on my um my MCB courses? I don't mind sharing this little trade secret of mine. All I do on the MCB course, I've got Canva is what I use to produce the presentations. And then I have a yeah. separate screen behind this one. And then I put the camera at the top here. And essentially what I do is the presenter view, I roll over on the separate screen. So it sits just above the camera there. And I do it in a compressed box. All I do is as I'm talking, it looks like I'm looking at the, the camera, but I'm actually looking at the script. And you can roll it through with your fingers. But again... It's not as animated because you're not moving your hands around as much, and you sometimes have to stop with the mouse and sort of do this with your hands a little bit when you've got a bit you know what you're going to say. But that can give the impression that you're not reading something, but you actually have a long script that you're going through. Yeah, just a thought. It's that definitely all helps. It's definitely one of those things if you've done like. But the thing is, uh, Matt, like I, I watched, I've watched you last year. You've done a lot of short form content. That's what I mean. Like, like the same with me. Like, 
I watched, I remember like you were one of the lockdown legends along with the rest of us making lots of content on LinkedIn back in the day. So like back in the days, like a year ago when everyone was like, fuck, let's do back it. Back in the day. It was like one year and it just felt like everyone was doing it. But like, it was just that, that thing. And so I'd say like, you've done a lot of short form content. And once you've done the short form, you could, it's just scaling it up. But I would say if you, if you take on like a big five minute video, I'd probably say, mate, just, just either do a five minute or just do like, I know, I know I showed you that repurpose thing, but something that's really good right now, if you want to get good at big view, just do a daily 30 second, 15 second thing. And if you do that for six, I don't know, say like three, four weeks, you'll be really good at it. And then you can yeah. do it. But what it's, it's pain. It's painful watching someone read a teleprompter if they're not good at it. And it's something I've learned because obviously I was trained in acting. I, I know we were taught to do it. And they were taught to like do little things like look away, move around, do different. So it looks like you're doing it. But like if you practiced it um, with 30 second videos, you'll, you'll, you'll get it. Um, but you'll, if you want to do it really well, though, you're always going to have to throw it into a, a third party editor. So just chuck it into CapCut. Um, you can use Video Leap as well. I use Video Leap because I bought it, but CapCut's free. And actually CapCut will also auto caption it. So it will give you subtitles on it. It'll subtitle it for you. Um, and it'll not only subtitle it for you, it'll subtitle it in the font of your choice. So not just like a shitty font. It'll actually do it in... How accurate? Uh, pretty accurate. I mean, you, you can go in and edit it. It's The thing with accuracy when it comes to, to these things, it's nothing to do with the actual AI. It's to do with this. So it's to do with how well your microphone is. When I speak into this, I'm literally 99% accurate. When I speak onto my phone, I'm lucky if it's like... 80%. So it is about the, 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 when it, when it comes to that, but even that is fine. If you're only doing a 50, like a 30 second to a minute video. And if, and if you've got a, a thick Northern Irish accent, I suppose that's a, uh, yeah, a, I don't know about Mark's so whether that would actually, you might spend half your day. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I've been, I've been playing about with having Canva or, or not, not Canva, sorry. The, um, what was it? On on work, you can actually speak into the onto the PC and the desktop, and you just talk. I'm actually trying to ch train my computer to my voice. Yes, you can do that. You have to do that. I haven't done it with my computer. That's really good if you can do that. Because I I've started to do scripts that way, um, and mm -hmm. it's it's actually cutting down my create creation time. You can write half. a blog really quick. I do that with um, my on my DDRs in the morning, like my daily, which I've been doing since Ross last week. Um, yeah. I will use, I, I just use voice notes as not voice notes, sorry, like dictative text. And if you do it every day, that's how on LinkedIn and stuff, you can say like really nice things because you're like actually talking how yeah. you're yeah. writing, how you would talk. So you're like, Oh my God, this was amazing. I loved how you did X, Y, and Z. It really, really made me feel. And then it looks like this massive message. And the reality is. It took you 10 seconds. It took me 10 seconds while I was walking the dog. <laughs> no, like, so, yeah. As well, because you actually saying it in as if you're saying it in, yeah. in vocal. I, I don't even bother like changing the spellings on it though because I'm dyslexic so I just I, I just pretend yeah, wait, wait. I just yeah. don't uh, you know most people just say thanks anyway <laughs> they don't respond yeah. so. a big, uh, uh, massive comment it's like yeah. got your heart yeah. and soul in it thanks <laughs> literally I actually like to see your, your stuff written with things spelled wrong anyway exactly it's authentic it makes, it, it makes us all feel good don't worry <laughs> <laughs> I better shoot off. We are way late. Yeah, yeah we are. Uh, it's my fault. My... I talk too much. Sorry. Gets excited about problem. things that are just not very excited. Well, Matt, I was just thinking, come on, mate. I know you like insurance, but <laughs> fucking hell. Hey, someone's got to make it sexy, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? We're still waiting for them to come in. That's what I was talking about. Uh, there he goes again. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. I've got a young, my son's looking me to go on Switch and do Mario Kart, so I better go. Yeah, uh, listen, thank you. Yeah, all. Looking forward to it. Listen, take care, and I'll speak to you yeah, all next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, guys.